Okay, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Carly Guest and I'm a senior lecturer in sociology here at Middlesex University. Um, so welcome, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how we can think about objects as social. So the title of my talk is A Tale of Three Objects. What can everyday objects tell us about the social world? So I'm going to talk to you for about sort of half an hour, um, but um, there'll be a chance at the end for you to ask any questions or make any comments. I've got um, a few things that I'm just going to propose that you might want to think about and do during the lecture as well. So um, do you have a go at that? And of course, if you've got any questions more generally about sociology at Middlesex, then um, feel free to ask them. So objects tell stories. So these are personal stories. They're full of emotion. Um, they're about our histories, our biographies. And in this talk, I'm going to trace the stories of three everyday objects and consider what they might tell us about the social world. And we'll think about how sociology engages with objects. And I would like to invite you to tell some object stories of your own as well. So I'm going to start by um, giving a brief overview of some of the ways in which sociology has engaged with um, the social world, including two research examples. And then I'm going to talk through three different objects and share some ideas on how we might think about these as social objects. And then there'll be some time for your questions and contributions. So throughout the talk, you will have the chance to use the Padlet to share your own object stories. Um, so you can either um, link to the Padlet by using this QR code here, or I think Natalie will be able to put the link to the Padlet um, in the chat if you prefer to access it that way. Um, if you haven't used a Padlet before, it's really easy. Um, you can uh, use it to sort of add images or stories or comments. When you go through, you'll see that I've already started adding some uh, resources on there. If you want to add any, add your own Padlet, you can um, add your own post on the Padlet. You can click on a small pink circle at the bottom right hand corner, or you can double click anywhere on the background. So what I want you to uh, think about is, um, what everyday objects you find interesting, and maybe some bullet points about why they might be a social object. So it's not a test or an assignment, it's just an opportunity for you to share your thoughts. Um, I've also added some photographs of everyday objects that you can add comments on. There's no right or wrong answers, so you might just add one sentence or one word to suggest a concept that you think is relevant to the object. Um, so what I would suggest is sort of consider what questions you need to ask of an object in order to understand it from a sociological, sociological perspective. So who made it? Who has access to it? What meanings does it convey? That kind of thing. So some sociological thinkers have um, viewed modern society as materialistic and as consumerist, and in doing so have viewed consumer culture and the stuff of social life in largely negative terms. Members of the Frankfurt School, uh, for example, have referenced, referenced to increased consumption as symptomatic of a loss of depth in the world. But other theorists have considered the ways in which things can make a positive contribution to social life. So Danny Miller, for example, in his book Stuff, suggests that objects shape and strengthen identity and are important to our relationship to ourselves and with others. So he gives the example of the family home and how the family home is often sort of discussed as being like a member of the family with its own unique needs. So we develop attachments to the family home and often idealize its significance. So the home and things contained within the home shape relationships between family members. So for example, the provision of food might mean more or means more than providing just energy or nutrition, but can be a marker of love and care or of celebration and comfort. And these can also be part of the performance we give to others. So think about, for example, uh, bringing the sort of best cutlery out when visitors come or saving the best biscuits for visitors, how we're sort of performing a certain part of ourselves to um, people outside of the home. So Rachel Hurdley is a sociologist who's also concerned with the meaning of stuff in people's homes. And she interviewed people about their mantelpieces, asking them to tell the stories of objects that um, sit on the mantelpieces. 
So Herdley suggests that the display of objects is part of the performance of the self and signals an awareness that the home is not an entirely private space, but is subject to the gaze of others. So some people she spoke to, for example, spoke about keeping objects that they didn't particularly like on their mantelpieces because they were gifts and they knew that their absence would be noticed if they removed them. So home is, Hurdley argues, a site of consumption practices. The things we display say something about social and economic relations and tell stories about the self. And the objects that we put on display in our homes and put on display for others are part of the construction of our own identities and speaks to our gender, our class, our race, our age and our other social positionings. And this is a, a really nice example um, of what Hurdy sort of means about the performance of the self through the stuff that, that we keep on mantelpieces. So this is from a photo project for the Guardian newspaper, where people were asked to talk about their mantelpieces and talk about the objects on them. And here, Jenna Diamond, who was one of the uh, people interviewed, talks about the emotional significance of objects that are linked to her father, who had recently passed away. She says here, these things my dad gave me inspire a whole lot. Whenever I talk about it, I feel different. I feel so emotional. Whenever I look at those things he gave me, I see them. So here the mantelpiece becomes a site of memory, of memorialization and remembrance for Jenna. Um, and you can see that through these objects, she's forging this ongoing relationship and connection with her father uh, just by sort of having them on display in her home. Um, so objects um, and remembering home is something that's also considered by Zeynep Turan, who was writing, who wrote this piece in 2010 about material objects, um, the relationship between for Palestinian members of the Palestinian diaspora to uh, material objects. And um, Turan suggests that these objects create a sense of homeland. Uh, so there is an, an, an attachment to an ancestral homeland an identity as as a Palestinian that is manifest through these objects. So in this work, Turan demonstrates how objects have an important association with people, places and emotions, but are also a link to the past. So there's this kind of idea of this, um, this history and this homeland and these ancestors, this connection to that. And this is particularly important, um, Turan argues, for uh, people who've experienced dislocation. The objects that people she interviewed talked about created a sense of co connection and continuity across time and place and allowed people to demonstrate and solidify their connection and relatedness to a group. So we can see here how these sort of everyday objects carry really strong um, emotional meanings and social significance. So thinking about objects sociologically can mean asking questions about identity, about memory, emotion, history. Mika Ball suggests that collecting objects speaks to a need to tell stories and argues that objects are stories in themselves. Excuse me. So um, she writes here that objects hang before the eyes of the imagination, continuously representing ourselves to ourselves and telling the stories of our lives in ways which would be otherwise impossible. <coughs> so Mika Bal is talking about objects as having this sort of storytelling power um, that we don't necessarily have through kind of um, verbal accounts of our lives, for example. So I want to talk about three objects now. And the first one is um, a quilt. So I'm going to tell the story of sort of three different, three different quilts or collections of quilts and how and um, suggest some ways that we can think about them as being sociologically significant. So this quilt was made by a grandmother for her grandson, marking his birth by lovingly quilting a tapestry of fabrics into this cot sized quilt. The little boy who's now 16 months old uses the quilt as a play mat, as a blanket to nap underneath and as a comforter. So the baby quilt became popular um, in Europe in the, in the mid 19, in the mid 1700s, when it's thought they were made to go with the production of children's beds or cribs. And this marked a shift from babies and children sleeping in their parents' beds and cribs to cribs beside them that happened in many Western countries. 
early baby quilts were made as replicas of adult quilts. So in terms of their color and style, they were just the same really, but on a smaller scale. But as the attitudes towards children change towards the end of the 19th century and childhood was seen as a period um, that was sort of distinct from adulthood, quilts began to reflect imagery associated with childhood interests. So um, you'd see kind of um, characters from childhood stories, um, different colours that were more associated with childhood being reflected in quilts. So they became more of an item associated with a particular um, period in the life course. But quilting has a much longer and diverse history with many stories to tell about it. Olga Idris Davis has studied the symbolism of the quilt in African-American children's literature and suggests that the quilt is a representation of black women's culture of resistance to dominance and control. In an extension of the oral tradition of storytelling, Davis suggests that quilting uses storytelling to share and preserve cultures across generations. So this is an example of one of the um, quilts of Guise Ben. So these are quilts that are created by a group of African-American women artists and their ancestors who lived in Guise Bend, Alabama, whose ancestry is traced back to people enslaved by the Petway plantation. These quilts were made for functional use, but developed a distinctive style, reusing available materials and um, geometrically simple designs, as you can see in, um, in this example by Louisiana Bendolf. Its members were often active in the civil rights movement. So one thing that they would do is ferry people to register to vote. And when the authorities isolated the community by closing this, the ferry service, the women founded the Freedom Quilting Bee to provide economic opportunity and political empowerment to the local community. So another um, quilt that holds a great sociological significance is the AIDS Memorial Quilt. So in 1985, um, our activist uh, Cleve Jones was planning the annual candlelit march in honor of the lives of Harvey Milk and George Moscone, who were both gay men who were assassinated in 1978. Now he asked his fellow marchers to write the names of friends and loved ones they'd lost to AIDS on placards, and these were all displayed together on a wall. And it was noted that once they were all put together, they created this sort of quilt patchwork quilt effect. So this inspired Jones to create an actual memorial quilt with panels dedicated to the names of individuals who had died. And from this, the Names Project Foundation was formed and the quilt was first displayed in 1987. The quilt now has 50,000 panels and it can be explored digitally through the National AIDS Memorial website which I've added to the Padlet, where users can search for individual panels and names. And the stories of each of these quilts, so the Age Memorial quilt, uh, the Baby quilt, and the, the uh, Guise Ben quilt, um, and of the quilters are wide ranging. So they're personal, political, and they can be understood through a sociological lens. The Baby quilt speaks to changing understandings and constructions of childhood and of how changes in industry, manufacturing, technological advances change the lives of many children and their position in the family. And we might draw on the work of Patricia Hill Collins and her Black Feminist Epistemology to think about storytelling through quilts in children's books or the work of the Guise Bend quilters. Black Feminist Epistemology emphasizes lived experience, storytelling and care as a way of exploring its social issues. And through this lens, we can explore the stories, histories, legacies and resistance that the quilters enact through their work. The AIDS Memorial Quilt offers us a way of understanding not only how art and craft can become a form of activism and resistance, of awareness raising and of protest, but also of memorialization. The quilt is a visual material memorial to some of the people who died from age during a period of intense stigma, prejudice and fear. So these are social artifacts that tell stories and in doing so create and shape our understanding of notions of childhood, of racism, of the enduring legacy of slavery, the power of storytelling and the ways in which a society can grieve, memorialize, remember and protest. So the next um, object that I want to talk about is quite different. Um, this is Katy Perry's Cool Kitty fake eyelashes. So these are, I think they were um, launched around 2012. 
and sold for a sort of retail price of around six, six pounds, six ninety-nine. And they're really about sort of giving people access to that sort of nineteen fifties pop culture aesthetic that that Katy Perry was known for, or is known for. So I want to tell two stories about these lashes and um and think about how we can understand them as sociological objects. So firstly, we have uh, Tatiana M, who um, in 2012 uh, did a five minute, 36 second YouTube video about her experience of these lashes. So she was doing a review of these lashes. So videos that are quite common to find on YouTube, kind of beauty bloggers, uh, product reviews, that kind of thing. So Tatiana was wearing the recently released Cool Kitty Katy Perry lashes. The young American woman offered the viewer a detailed look of the lashes that she's wearing and carefully details the contents of the package for the viewer. Tatiana emphasizes how pretty and cute the lashes are and is especially pleased with the Katy Perry, Perry brand. She encourages her viewers to uh, purchase the lashes. So in this short video, Tatiana is participating in celebrity and consumer culture. She's engaging positively with the lashes, particularly because of the Katy Perry branding. And she's also taking part in the presentation of the self through beauty blogging, using the product to display and shape her identity and forge a connection with the audience. So in order to understand what she's doing here, we might think about sociological concepts such as Judith Butler's gender performativity, which considers the ways in which we present embodied gendered performances that mimic and imitate ideas about what gender is. Or we might use work by people like Christine Fellinger and so Kirsten Fellinger and Christine Williams, who discuss the relationship between beauty products, class and purchasing power. Or this uh, review might tell us something about the gendered expectations of appearance, so where there's often more pressure on women to conform to and enact certain beauty standards, but also question these and ask whether social media, technology and other aspects of social change have altered the extent to which these pressures are felt by all genders and are perhaps mediated by age and visibility as much as gender. So these are all ways of engaging sociolog sociologically with Tatiana's review of the Katy Perry lashes. But our second photograph gives us more to consider about this everyday item. So here in the second picture, you can see 20 year old Friti who gave birth to her first child two months prior to this photo being taken. And here Friti, who lives just outside Perbalinga in Indonesia is making lashes. She makes around 32 pairs a day and is paid two pence for each pair. So she was speaking to the Guardian journalist um, who in 2012 was writing about the eyelash industry and she says here, I finished school but I did not have the money to go on in higher education though I would have liked to. I wanted to be a teacher but now I think I will always be doing this because I don't know what else to do. Sometimes I feel dizzy, I have problems with my eyes but I can't afford glasses. I've never worn false eyelashes but I think I'd quite like to try a pair just to know how it feels. So Friti gives us a different way of understanding the lashes and using the con and using the concepts of globalization, capitalism, worker exploitation. Ilio, which is the company that produces the Katy Perry glass um, lashes, started as a British company based in Welling Garden City before moving its manufacturing to Cambrian in Wales. And it's moved to subcontracting manufacturing to PT Corinda, which is a firm based in Indonesia, is an example of the impact of globalization on manufacturing processes. Friti's story gives us an understanding of the impact of consumer culture that Tatiana is engaging in. So that is where the satisfaction, that is where satisfaction is accomplished through the acquisition of commodities that are available for sale or exchange in the market. So our understanding and connection to the production of the commodities we purchase has become so disconnected that when we buy things like lashes in the in, in certain Western countries, the experiences of those people who are actually making them becomes invisible. The disconnection between is a consequence of global capitalism, and it is what allows worker exploitation to continue largely unchallenged. Indeed, this invisibility is necessary to, con to uh, the continued production and consumption of objects like Katy Perry's cool kit and lashes. So our final object is Foxy's Christmas jumper. So this jumper was bought from a pet shop in New York in November 2018, ready for the upcoming Christmas. 
It was bought for Fox, who is a four-year-old cockapoo living on a boat in London, you can see in this picture. And although Fox has a thick coat when it's fully grown, when he'd been freshly groomed with his thick poodle-like hair trimmed close to his body, he did tend to feel the cold. So the jumper would keep him warm during the cold British winters. But it also served as more than a practical function. The jumper also signifies the importance of animals, of pets, to our personal life and relationships. So in thinking about this jumper, we might consider Becky Tipper's work on the sociology of pets. Tipper considers how pet keeping is related to social structures and social change. So more than half of households in Western society have pets and Tipper argues pet keeping in the 21st century has taken on a particularly distinctive character, which is characterized by great material and emotional investment in pets. Tipper observes that animals become part of the idea, idea of an ideal home and of a loving and intimate family throughout the 19th century in Europe and North America and suggests that this was a consequence partly of increased affluence that made caring for an animal um, just for the sake of doing so um, possible. So in addition, Harriet Ritvo has argued that animals became to be seen as charming and lovable due to the process of industrialization, medical and technological advances that gave humans a sense of, of their own mastery over nature. Pets are uh, still, as Tipper argues, entangled with ideas about wealth and social class. So purebred dogs, for example, reflecting the status of their owner. And certain animals might be attributed, might be given more feminine or more masculine associations, or be linked to uh, regional or national identities, uh, histories, or folklore. Alongside the invention of photography in the 1800s came well-dressed job dogs as its subject. Trends in dog wear started to emerge and were no longer purely functional. Industrialization allowed for the mass production of dog clothing, which consequently became more affordable. More recently, celebrity culture, the internet and increased mass production saw a boom in the dog fashion industry. However, dog fashion isn't a solely a recent phenomenon, although it may have taken on a particularly distinctive character and have mass appeal since the sort of early 200, early noughties. But in ancient Egypt and ancient China, for example, collars were decorated with scenes from a dog's life or with precious jewels. And in ancient Rome and Japan, war dogs were often fitted with armor to match their owners. So the relationship between humans and their pets is deeply sociological and can be considered in relation to industrialization, to personal and intimate lives, gender, class, status, and regional and national identities. So the dog jumper signifies the place of the pet in the family, being invited to celebrating festive events like Christmas, but also the relationship to consumer culture and the ways in which our lives have been impacted by it. So pet clothes, jewelry, grooming, healthcare, accommodation, travel, these are all areas where it's possible to spend vast volumes of money on pets and that shape and, sh and are shaped by contemporary consumerism and signal a re-evaluation of the relationship between animals and humans. So why are these particular items? So all are part of their of everyday lives in, in um, many ways, but also have wider social significance and have been taken up. So these sort of everyday items like the quilt have been taken up as um, as a kind of marker of different things like um, memorializing things or activism, etc. All can also tell us something about how personal objects are socially formed. So they have historic, per historical, personal, global significance and stories to tell. And interestingly, all have been included in some form in museum collections. So they're seen as important for heritage purposes. So there is a recognition um, that documenting people's everyday lives um, is, is important. So, it's, so these kind of everyday objects have something to say about everyday lives. And it demonstrates an understanding of the personal as having historical and social significance. So I um, wanted to share with you just a, a way of thinking or a sort of framework for thinking about everyday objects. And this comes from a, um, a book called Introducing Sociology Using the Stuff of Everyday Lives, um, which is a book that we use in the first year of the first year of the sociology degree at Middlesex. So if you do come to Middlesex, then it's something that you 
um, might look at. Um, so these sociological thinking frames are material, cultural, structure, agency, and micro macro. So I'm just going to talk uh, talk through these um, and give you a kind of idea of how we might use these. If you can hear rustling in, in the background, I'm really sorry. That is a fox from the picture before who's just come in and stolen a bag of crisps. So um, he might make a bit of noise. Um, so material cultural so the idea of the material is um that objects have a material existence so they're made from stuff they come from somewhere um they have a physical presence they're made from um they're made by people and machines so this kind of makes us think about the production of the lashes but they're also cultural they carry cultural meaning they're symbolic of things beyond their material existence they're part of rituals they carry meaning and value and these are culturally culturally and historically specific so we need to understand the material and cultural dimension of objects we can't really separate the two so in the book that I shared with you, um, the, they use the example of genes, and this is a quote from that book. The evolution of genes wearing cannot be understood without appreciating material, the material context surrounding their rise to fashion prominence or the rich cultural meaning they come to embody. So, sorry. Structure agency. So... Structure are the patterns that organize, it refers to the patterns that organize social life, so gender inequality, capitalism, colonialism, racial hierarchies, economic situations, and objects re re reflect and reproduce structural possibilities and constraints. So you might think about how, for example, the, um, the these bend quilt makers are um, commenting on how these structural inequalities impact people's lives. Agency refers to the ability to make decisions and take action. So it might be limited to, um, so our, our ability to make these decisions is limited by structural complaints. So our social, loca our social location impacts on our agency. And again, going back to, um, to the book that you might encounter in your first year at Middlesex, the option of buying expensive jeans is not available to everybody. A white, thin, heterosexual, wealthy woman might feel welcome in designer shops without feeling subject to suspicion or ridicule, for example. So her lo social location makes certain types of clothing and shopping experiences available to her. Um, so the final thinking frame is micro macro so micro sociology focuses on social interaction and meaning making so what are interactions and exchanges like how so how is social life created through everyday interactions macro sociology focuses on large collectives so thinking about systems and structures and these approaches complement each other to offer different levels of detailed understanding so micro sociology can help us understand the depth of an issue um, looking, for example, at the significance in people's um, everyday lives. And macro sociology can help us think about the breadth. So looking at kind of changing patterns across time. And again, to go back to the example of jeans, um, jeans shifted from a uniform to a fashion item. And this took place in the macro, macro context of changing policy and trade relations, as well as micro changes in meaning making and self-expression. So I'm going to finish uh, with one sort of bonus <laughs> um, object story, um, just to really illustrate how we can use these thinking frames to, to take a sort of personal memory or story and set it in its sociological context. So I'll read this out to you. Uh, so this is an object story about a hairbrush. I remember my hair being brushed by my mum when I was younger. It's such a strong memory, I can feel it. I would sit on the floor in front of her and she would brush my flyaway hair, occasionally getting stuck on a knot. She'd then style it into a French plait, and this would take repeated efforts as she went wrong and did the plait, brushed my hair, started again. She didn't have a specific brush for plaiting, so would use the edge of a hairbrush similar to this one to move the hair into place. After all the pulling, brushing, plaiting and unplaiting, she'd tie the plait tightly in place with a plain black bubble, pat me on the shoulders and tell me we were done. Often this would take place when my mum was sitting on the sofa, chatting to a friend. 
I remember the distinct sense that she was distracted, not completely focused on me. Sometimes she'd stop what she was doing, hold my hair in place for ages, absorbed by her conversation. Sometimes if I moved to get more comfortable or flinched at the brush getting caught in the knot, my mum would stop brushing and focus entirely on her conversation. I loved having my hair brushed by my mum, and so she would sit as, and so would sit as still as possible to the point where I got pins and needles in my feet so she wouldn't stop. So how can we think about this through those um, objects? How can we think about this object story through those thinking frames? Material cultural. The object has a material existence built for a particular purpose. Different types of brushes were made for different purposes. Type. So we might ask who makes them, what are they made from, changing materials, for example, so they used to be made by expensive, for, by, from expensive wood and animal hair to cheaper plastic that, was, that is mass produced. Hairbrushes can carry different meanings. They used to be a popular gift for babies and brides. Um, it's also often a gendered activity. And this memory in particular links to childcare, so the idea of Hostchild's um, second shift which refers to the kind of um, work and emotional investment that uh, women are expected to, to make in um, activities like childcare. So structure and agency, hairstyling used to be the reserve of the wealthy, gendered expectations of hairstyling, um, but these have there are gendered expectations of hairstyling, but these change across time. Hairstyling carries different meanings and possibilities across race, gender, age, and sexuality. And there are different possibilities for hairstyling for what is considered respectable, what is feminine, masculine. So there's obviously a lot of judgment um, um, overlaid onto ideas about hairstyling. And the micro and macro thinking frame. So hairstyles can be social, relational, uh, they can be done for ease. They relate to ideas often about hygiene and healthy hair. We see that a lot in kind of advertising around hair products. And plaiting in particular carries different meanings cross-culturally. So in some cultures, only married women can wear plaits. In others, it's often associated with young girls. So you can see here, hopefully, how we can take this sort of personal story and use these sociological thinking frames as a way of understanding um, and thinking about the social sociological significance of everyday items. So I'm going to finish um, finish there. And if there are any questions or if you've had the chance to to um, have a look at the Padlet and post any ideas on the Padlet, um, then um, that would be wonderful. Okay, thank you. I was just going to say um, uh, thanks for that. Um, if everybody, anybody's got any questions, please um, put them in the chat and I can ask Kylie the questions. Um, the recording of this will be available afterwards in about a week's time once they've been edited. And um, if you've got any questions for Kylie on sociology or, or any of particular areas within that lecture that she just gave for us, please put some questions in the chat, in the Q&A. We'll wait a minute. We'll give it a minute, Carly. Yeah, sure. So was that your dog I could hear? I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I hope he wasn't too disruptive. He, no, he's, he's fine. He's fine. He snuck in, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, then we've got a question. Let's have a look. Uh, so would... Would we be given coursework like this to do activities to do with objects that are personal to us? Yes, absolutely. So one, um, so I'll just give you an example for a, a module that I teach, uh, which is called Sociological Selves, um, where we, we are thinking about kind of autobiographical um, methods and ways of thinking about the relationship between the personal and the social one of the or the assignment for that is a photo voice project where you would be asked to think about the sociological theme of belonging um, and take photographs that relate to that from your sort of everyday life so um for example people in the past have done stuff around um around clothing so how how does their clothing kind of signify belonging to a particular um, social group or how does it create a sense of belonging um, hair styling and beauty products are also um, also another kind of really popular theme and a really useful way for thinking about um, that idea of belonging in in lots of different ways so yes you do that 
Um, and I'd, it's not the only module, but that's that's a sort of example of where you where you might use this kind of method. Thanks, Colleen. There's another one. How is sociology assessed at Middlesex? So in terms of the assessments, um, there's a there's a wide range. So you'd get things that are your kind of like traditional essays um, that you would be used to doing, I suppose, uh, um, in the courses you're possibly studying now. Uh, we have presentations, there are group presentations, individual presentations, things like kind of more autobiographically focused work, like the photo voice project that I've just um, mentioned. Uh, there are there are people, there are, um, I think there's one exam, I think there's one module that, that has an exam. Um, and then obviously there's the, the dissertation as well. Uh, so we, what we have sort of aimed to do is have a sort of wide range of assessment to really allow you to kind of show your strengths and um, engage with sociological ideas in a variety of ways, rather than just being kind of confined to say an essay or an exam. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question just coming. What kind of dissertations have been done by students recently? Well, so the dissertations are always really interesting because they're, they're very wide ranging, actually. So um, they're so just thinking of some that I have um, supervised in the last few years, um, things about the sort of presentation of self on social media, um, um, beauty blogging is is one that I um, that I supervised a few years ago. We have a, Middlesex has a museum of um, domestic design and architecture, and uh, they are really have a really great kind of range of, um, the, a really great sort of range of artifacts that you can engage with as a, um, as a student in dissertation. So for example, I had a student who uh, looked at the sort of gendered, gendered and raced representation of women in women's magazines across time. So um, yeah, there are lots of, lots of really kind of interesting areas. And really what the dissertation does is, is give you an opportunity to explore in depth something that you're really passionate about and you're really interested in. Um, you might do that through kind of desk based work, so a more sort of um, looking at kind of different types of literature and um, comparing different ideas, or you might do something that's more um, empirical based. So you might want to do a quantitative piece of work that's maybe using a survey, or you might want to do something qualitative that where you're interviewing people, where you're talking to people. So you really, as long as you, you know, you get the support to, um, you get the support to, um to put together a research project that really works but you also get that kind of freedom to look at something that you're really interested in okay thank you Carly. Um, there's another couple of questions and uh, nicole's asked uh, what kind of students are you looking for to study sociology i think um the the sort of key attributes i guess are a curiosity and openness to thinking about the social world thinking about our place within it um you you know we have we have students come in who have studied sociology before so who might have this sort of familiarity with these kinds of ideas that i'm talking about but also we have students come in that haven't studied sociology before so it's not necessarily about do you have a kind of certain knowledge base but do you have an approach to studying um and an, an approach to kind of thinking about these ideas in creative ways um that that means that you're you're excited about kind of learning and thinking about these ideas and a lot of our um classes are uh, discussion based are um activity based you know there's a lot of we really want to encourage a kind of active learning and active engagement so um we we hope that um we can we can support students in in really kind of actively engaging with these ideas and exploring these ideas and, and being open to learning i think that's really important and i think that happens for everybody in the classroom you know it happens for for us as lecturers, it happens for students, everybody's bringing something 
Um, and so those kind of discussions can be really exciting and interesting. And if you're open to kind of um, learning and thinking about the world in that way, then um, that's, I would say, the kind of student that we um, really enjoy working with. Okay, thank you. There's one more question come in. Um, would you talk about the impacts of COVID socially? Wow, yes. <laughs> um, that, I mean, that's a huge question, isn't it? And I think, um, in a way, we're still, um, we're still kind of understanding that I think we're still seeing the the impact of this experience that has just been has affected people in, in lots of different ways. So I think one thing um, thinking sociologically about COVID is it's really both exacerbated, but also highlighted social inequality. So um, there'll be people who, you know, we've all been, we've all gone through this very sort of difficult experience, but what that's meant has been very different for different people. So it's been very different if you're in a kind of secure job, you were easily um, able to uh, work from home or you carried on kind of, um, you carried on kind of looking, working from home or you were, you, you carried on being paid and had that financial security, uh, things like you kind of had the space while you were isolating. Did you have the outdoor space um, or were you living in a, in a kind of, small flat that didn't really have access to any outdoor space and you're only allowed out once a day. Um, those kinds of things, thinking about kind of housing inequality, um, work inequality, uh, thinking about what it meant to be on a zero hours contract or in precarious work and the impact that that has had when everything shut down. Um, health inequalities, I think it's really highlighted those kinds of issues as well. Um, so I suppose I, I would say, I mean, there is a huge amount to say about the social implications and the social uh, about COVID from a sociological perspective, but I think thinking about how it has really highlighted and exacerbated social inequalities is is a key one um, and something that's really important because that that is having an ongoing impact. That's not just going to go away. Yeah, I agree. I agree it's gonna that I mean there's a lot of impact if you've got a family as well if you live at home with your family as well and you're all you've got people trying to work and educate young people as well at home Absolutely. so that's definitely gonna have yeah. an impact yeah and I think having all of those different experiences you know there's the experience of being in a in a home where you have you know you have children at home and you're trying to work and homeschool and then there's the the experience of living alone and and having not having that kind of human contact and the impact that that will have had on many people in during during lockdown so i think the challenge of thinking about kind of what has just happened is that it's that it's been experienced so differently for for different people yeah okay there's another question coming for do do you have any podcast books or documentaries or recommendations for anyone wanting to apply for sociology um that would help them maybe there are lots of really good um there are lots of really good kind of open access journals so like um um social i'm going to probably going to get the name wrong so i'm going to google it while i'm talking but social sociology online um there's there's kind of those kinds of what i would suggest actually uh, rather than kind of specific podcasts because i think there are so many, um, is going on Google Scholar. So Google Scholar, if you if you haven't used it, um, it's like a search engine for academic work. Um, and you can search in any topic there. And whilst a lot of the things that come up require kind of access that you would get, for example, if you're a student at Middlesex, um, you'll also get a lot of open access things. Um, and just reading, just getting used to kind of reading um, reading sociological work, getting used to the sort of terminology, like you you will be doing a lot of reading when you're at Middlesex, um, which can be a challenge, and but also it's, it's where a lot of the learning happens, but it's not something that you're expected to kind of get used to overnight. So I think if there are topics that you're interested in, just kind of using somewhere like Google Scholar and exploring those kinds of ideas, seeing what kind of open access stuff there is, um, is is a really good way of going about it i think um things like 
like the kind of um the introducing sociology book that i that i shared they're they're kind of i mean it's not necessary to to look at those before starting the course but um if you have access to a copy at a library or can request it through your local library um then they're 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 quite good for introducing you to those sort of key concepts thank you and um, there's another question coming around um what kind of uh, career careers do sociology students go on to get afterwards um again that can be quite wide ranging um i think what sociology does is it kind of gives you it's not the same as a a sort of vocational degree where you're being trained say for example in nursing where you're being trained to go and do a particular job but it gives you quite a wide set of skills in sort of thinking critically about the world um of understanding um how our kind of everyday experiences are always kind of shaped by social structures etc um and and that can be really helpful and useful in lots of different jobs so we have students who uh will go on and do further training in things like social work um teaching um we have students who go on and want to do more academic study so might go and do a master's um to kind of think in more detail about particular issues uh we have students that work in the care sector but also students that kind of that go into um hr for example or into um into retail and so there's that i think you can use the kind of skills and the kind of knowledge that you're gaining in a in a sociology degree in lots of different ways um obviously for some jobs there is particular additional training that you'll need to do so it's worth i think if you have a particular job that you know you want to eventually go into it's worth having a look at the route into that job before deciding what you're going to do for your undergraduate um but sociology is a really great degree for giving you a good foundation for lots of different um roles i think thank you there is no more questions has anybody got any more questions for carly um i don't think so um so what will happen now is thanks for joining us um we, we will have a recording which will come be sent to you in about a week's time once it's been edited. Um, and if you've got any more questions, you can get in touch with us through lots of channels. We've got an open our next, we've got on campus um, on Thursday from 2 p.m. in the afternoon if you want to come and see the university. We've got an open day in June. There's lots of things um, people you can get in touch with if you've got any further questions related to emissions or um, particular courses or just want to see the campus because you haven't had a chance to see it yet. So thanks for, oh, there's a question just come in. What is the difference between a BA Honours and a normal undergraduate BA degree? Uh, the BA Honours um, usually relates to having your dissertation. Um, so it's that extra set of credits. Okay, thank you. Plain <laughs> blunt. Done. So I think that's all we have time for this evening. So thanks for joining us. Um, thanks very much, Carly, and no um, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, and apologies for my noisy dog. I hope he wasn't too that's fine. distracting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.